pleasure and a joy for me to be here on this virtual platform, uh, worshiping together. Uh, I, I, I believe that, uh, that this is pleasing to God Almighty. So I want to thank all of you for coming and participating in, the, in our worship, learning together, growing together. Brethren, to introduce my subject, I thought we will take three simple questions and we will, we will title our message. Here's the, here's, here's the first one. Life goes on, life moves on. What is the primary cause? The second one is what deferred makes the heart sick? And finally, what is it? If we have in this life only, then we are men most miserable. Yes, please. Any guesses? <laughs> any, any takers? <laughs> okay. The answer for all the three questions is hope. You see, life moves on because primarily it is hope. And then what deferred makes the heart sick? It is hope. When there is no hope. When the, and the third answer is what if we have in this life only, then we are men more miserable. It is hope. Our hope goes beyond this life. And so, brethren, we come, the title of my sermon today is Hope and Promises. Uh, but uh, before we uh, launch into our, sub, into our text, uh, let us make a few observations. The reason I'm making these observations is it will become easier for us to understand what the text is saying. And then we can better appreciate what it is saying. Okay, let's make four quick observations. Observation number one, uh, let us understand. Um, observation one is about hope and promises. See, hope and promises are deeply intertwined. They are intertwined inextricably. Uh, as parents, as family members, we all know. Uh, let's say you make a promise to your child or you made, a, you made a promise to your friend and you don't keep it. What happens? Next time, their, their trust in you is broken and they will, they will have great difficulty in putting their hope in you. So similarly, brethren, in the Old Testament, we read God made innumerable promises and some of them were covenant promises. But the children of Israel uh, did not keep their part of the promises. Yet the amazing thing, the most, uh, the most fascinating thing is God is always faithful and he keeps his promises, even though the Israelites were not keeping their promises. So I want you to understand that hope and promises are interconnected inextricably. Uh, let's make another comment. Uh, hope and the tirade. Uh, we all know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, it talks about love. The Apostle Paul speaks about a triad, faith, hope and love. And he says the greatest is, the greatest is love. But did you? Uh, but I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that this triad, faith, hope, and love, are are intertwined inextricably. Uh, let me quote to you from Rick Schallenberger, uh, our elder in U.S. and also who's now on the editorial team. He writes in the Acuper and he says, uh, while Paul made a clear distinction showing love is the greatest. He did not imply faith, hope, and love are not interconnected. We cannot have faith without hope, hope without love, love without faith. How can we have faith in Jesus if he is not our hope? How can we have hope in him if, if we don't trust in his love for us? How can we love him if we don't trust him and, how, and have faith in him? Faith, hope, and love work together in our individual lives and in the life of the church. Yes, brethren, hope that this triad is, is inextricably interconnected. <coughs> Let's move on to the next uh, 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 third observation. How important is hope? I think the best way to uh, understand is to take uh, examples, two examples. Let me share with you stories, two stories. These are real stories. Uh, closer home, there was a young man he was a dashing, debonair young man. He was dynamic. Uh, it so happened he had a physical ailment and his eyesight was very poor. Uh, his eyesight was weak. One day he went to the, he went to the ophthalmologist and then the doctor uh, uh, gave his diagnosis. And uh, 
uh, he said, uh, dear friend, very soon uh, your, eyes, your eyes vision is deteriorating and very soon you will lose your eyesight. <coughs> Needless to say, this particular uh, news came as a shock. He couldn't digest it. He couldn't uh, 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 take it. And so what he did was he took a snap decision. Why? Because a lot of negative thoughts stormed into his mind. He said, how can I live the rest of my life being blind? How can I live the rest of my life being dependent on a would-be spouse? How can I live dependent on a family member? And so, brethren, he did what? He did something that was totally unexpected. The error of judgment. He threw in the towel. He committed suicide. Brethren, why did he commit suicide? Here is a young, promising individual. Here is a dynamic individual who could have blossomed into a, a blessing for, <coughs> for himself and for his family because he did not have hope. When he lost, when the doctor announced that he's going to lose his hope, he lost hopes. He, he lost hope of being healed. He thought that's the end of life. There is no point in living. Brethren, he did not have hope. He did not have faith. Contrast this with another beautiful example, and that is, uh, and, <coughs> excuse me. I want to share with you another beautiful example, and that is about the uh, Fanny Crosby. Many of you must have heard this lady. She is described as the American hymn queen. Uh, when she was a little child, she had an infection in the eye. And the, she was taken to a quack, and this particular quack messed it up, and she lost her vision for the rest of her life. Brethren, what a tragedy. What an unthinkable tragedy. She suffered the loss of vision all because of the uh, error of the quack who, who attended on her. Brethren, she lost her vision. But did she become depressed? Did she throw in the towel and say, that's it? I'm going to say enough is enough? No, she had hope. She had faith. She trusted the one who gave her life. And she said, Lord, I am suffering for no fault of mine. You gave me life and you take care of me for the rest of my life. <coughs> and so, brethren, she had hope. She had trust. And because she committed her life to her, she slowly, she grew and she became strong and she, she, grew, she blossomed into a brilliant uh, musical composer. Fanny Crosby wrote anything between 5,000 to 8,000 hymns. You remember this? You remember the songs that we sing? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Safe in the arms of Jesus. I am thine, O Lord. And hundreds of sermons. She, she was a blessing to herself and to, her, and to the larger Christian community. Brethren, she, Fanny Crosby, did not throw in the towel, all because she had hope that the God who gave her life will also sustain her and take care of her. And so, brethren, it's a beautiful example. Can you look at the impact? We had, this particular lady had, when she was young, she had hope, she had faith. And because of that, she had life and became a blessing to millions of people. She received large royalty from the hymns she wrote and she gave it away to orphanages and to the poor people, to home for the aged. And so brethren, let's move on to, we understand how important hope is. If, if you don't have hope, life is going to become miserable. Life is going to become problematic. It's going to be devastating. On the contrary, if you have hope, that is life, that is joy. That is something will be a blessing to you and to others. And let's take our last observation. Where is our hope found? Is our, do you and I have hope in our bank balances? Do you and I have our hope in our, in our influence, in, the, in our strength? Brethren, do, can you and I generate hope from within? No, brethren, it is not like that. Uh, hope is not found inside of us. Hope is not found around. You cannot find hope in the, in the horizontal dimension. Hope is found only in the vertical dimension in our transcendent Lord. There are many ways of looking at it, uh, but uh, let me tell you how it is. Uh, the one important question you have to consider is, do you know who God is? 
If you answer this question correctly, hope will automatically seep into your deepest recesses. Let me tell you a, a true story that happened hundreds of years ago. The prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah had the unique privilege of seeing his prophecies coming to pass. It's, Jerusalem was reduced to shambles on the rubble and the ashes of uh, on the ashes of the ruins. Jeremiah on the debris, he was walking around and he said, "How can this happen? How can this happen to the city that is a, that is known that where God Himself came and is going to bless this and make it a great nation?" And then, brethren, in the midst of gloom and doom, Jeremiah recalls to mind one important factor. This I recall to my mind. He says he understood about God's nature and character, and he goes on to write it. His mercies never fail. His compassions never cease. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Brethren, Jeremiah, the reason Jeremiah had hope in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of devastation was because he reminded himself that there is hope. And God is going to give them all the blessings. That the devastation is not the end of it all. There's another way of looking at it. Brethren, the God whom you and I worship, worship is described as a God of hope. Uh, let me read to you from Romans chapter 15 and 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of Holy Spirit. Brethren, God wants to give you hope. He wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to blossom and enjoy life both in the year and now and for all eternity. But we, as Christians, we need to understand Jesus died for, for us and he rose again. He is our living hope. Our, our certainty of hope wraps itself in a person, the Lord Jesus. He is our hope. Jesus is our hope. He is our glory, our precedent, our pattern, our guarantee. His resurrection brought us into a living hope which we stand. And I could go on and say that the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, confirms our hope. For everything that was written in him in the past was written to teach us so that we through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures might have hope. And so brethren, how where is our hope? Brethren, our hope is found only in Christ. Our hope is found in the scriptures. Our hope is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let's move on to the text, our main text with those observations. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or verses, uh, verses uh, 13 to 18, uh, that, was, that was read to us by Selina. Uh, let's understand the context. Now, when Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians, the, the, uh, the brethren in Thessalonians were going through persecution. Persecution was still raging and uh, uh, they were living with, with fear and with tension. Uh, suddenly on any, <clears throat> on any night, there can be a knock on the door or you can hear the footsteps at your, at the, at your gate and you will be hauled up and then you will be imprisoned or you'll be, you be cast into, you'll be uh, killed. But then they were living in constant fear and worry. And so the, the brethren in Thessalonica longed for the return of Jesus Christ. They believed that he's coming and they longed for it, but they had genuine concerns. And during the persecution, many of the members, they lost many of their dear ones. And so they were asking the question, they were asking a question, what happens to the loved ones who died? And what happens to our status when Jesus returns? Basically, they were asking a fundamental question. And that question was, can, can we trust God that he will keep his promise of the resurrection? Brethren, that is the question, brethren. And Paul answers that question in verses, uh, verses 13 to 18. It's a beautiful explanation. And uh, let me read to you. But... Uh, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus Christ, God will bring him within those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself 
with the cry of the command and the archangel call and with the sound of trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Paul is giving a vivid picture of Christ's second coming. Brethren, the first important observation he, must, he makes is, he's telling the Thessalonian brethren, uh, please don't grieve uh, without hope. When you grieve, remember there is hope. You have hope beyond the physicality. Death is not the end of all life. Our lives on this planet Earth are temporal. We look forward to eternity. And he's telling them, whenever you grieve, remember you have hope. And our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, he is the one. What Paul then goes on to say, you see, he's connecting three things. He's connecting the resurrection of the dead. He's connecting our resurrection and he's connecting these two resurrections to the resurrection of Christ. That is the key component of faith. In him, we live and move our being. We are united with Christ, both in his death and his resurrection. Did you know what Paul did, brethren? We who are alive, the first uh, group, and then the second group, those who have died, he connects these two groups to the Christ's resurrection. And he says, we all will meet in the air. And then he goes on to explain that the, uh, the second coming of Christ is not going to be a spectacle that is going to be done in the corner of a house. It's not something that uh, nobody will see. It's going to be a grand spectacular with pomp and grandeur. Now, during the Roman, in fact, um, the Paul borrows this metaphor from the Roman government. Whenever the king visited a particular place, heralds announced his uh, arri arrival. And then there were high-level delega uh, delegates of the, of the city who would go to receive him. And they received him and they escorted him back to home. Brethren, uh, Paul is telling them Christ's second coming is going to be a public spectacle for everybody to see. It is a spectacle of great anticipation and joy. Why? They will go. When Christ comes, he's going to bring all the de our dead loved ones. He's going to unite us and the dead ones with Christ. There's, it's, a, it's a time. <clears throat> it's a time when everybody can watch it. It's a grand celebration of joy and rejoicing. But then Paul is telling. He's sharing the details of what happens when Christ himself comes. And then Paul goes on to say, Paul goes on to say, uh, finally, brethren, remind others of this promise so that we will be with the Lord forever. Brethren, our ultimate destiny is to be with the Lord ever. That's great news. That is a, one of the foundational teaching of Christianity. Brethren, our lives are not here on this planet temporal, but we look forward to a time when we spend time in uh, the eternity with the God Almighty. That is a time of great rejoicing and hope. And Paul reminds us to share this promise with others. And he's telling them, encourage one another with these hopes. And so, brethren, the second coming of Christ yeah, that's what I in vivid terms. And we are told that this is going to be a very joyous reunion of loved ones. What, what, is, what brethren, are the takeaways from this particular uh, passage? I believe there are three, three lessons that you and I can learn. Jesus' resurrection is proof that God keeps his promise. Remember the, the uh, basic question the Thessalonians were asking? Uh, uh, they believed in the, in the return of Christ, but they, were, they had concerns. What will happen to their loved ones? What will happen uh, to, to the living people? Will, will God keep his promises about the resurrection? And Paul is giving them the solid evidence. He says, just as Jesus rose from the dead, we, you and I too, are going to rise. Through the resurrection, we have been given new life. We are citizens of a different kingdom. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, because we are included in Jesus, we can trust God that he will raise us too. This fuels hope in us and a bright, glorious future for you as you trust our God. Brethren, Jesus' resurrection 
is evidence God keeps his promises. A second lesson that you and I can learn is people need to be reminded of the hope of the resurrection. There is a, everywhere you look around, there is pain, there is loss, there is suffering, there is death. They are part of the human experience. We cannot wish it away. We cannot uh, solve these problems. They are insurmountable. But brethren, our hope, there is hope. And our hope is not in this temporal world. We do grieve for our loved ones, but we don't grieve without hope. We know that Jesus is our hope. And he has called us to remind others about this resurrection, brethren. And so the second lesson that you and I can learn is the hope of the resurrection. You and I, brethren, will meet the Lord in the air or and all our loved ones will be resurrected in the world tomorrow. And finally, brethren, Jesus is the promise that shows the importance of keeping a promise. The, there were hundreds of, there were dozens of promise, hundreds of promise in the Old Testament. The promises find their fulfillment in Christ. Not only do we continually look to Jesus and help others to turn to Jesus, but we also know the importance of our word. Because we understand our hope and promises, we, we take our promises seriously. You see, the promises and hope are intertwined. And when we make a promise to others, let's be careful that we keep our, our promise, we keep our word. Brethren, that should give us hope. That should give us hope. And that should allow us to pass on the grace of God to others. And so, brethren, the Christian message is fundamentally unique. It's a message of hope. It's a message of joy. Brethren, all the loved ones, the living, everybody will have a glorious future in Christ. What a glorious future, brethren. God's promises are reliable. You can depend upon it. When you, go, when you are discouraged, when you are down in the dumps, and when you feel that you are facing the Red Sea in your life, remember to turn to Jesus. He is our hope. Remember to turn to the scriptures for comfort. And don't forget the resurrection in Christ. And so, brethren, let me, let me tell you that God's promises are reliable. They are, they are reliable. And you and I can rely on God's promises of bringing about the resurrection of the dead and the union of the living. At this moment, uh, let me close my message by asking Praveen to play a video that God always keeps his promise. Have you ever made the same promise to two different people? In our fast-moving world, we may easily do this unintentionally, like promising to meet a friend for dinner, only to remember you already told another friend you would help her with a project. Or maybe you promise to take your daughter to a movie the same night you scheduled to watch your son's baseball game. It's the classic mistake of double booking. It may have been a simple mistake, but it introduces a complex problem. You will have to choose who to break your promise to. Doing this can become tricky. You don't want to appear to play favorites and you don't want to create tension between your two friends or in your family. Hopefully they will understand, but there's the risk of hurt feelings, maybe even some jealousy, not to mention damaged trust. However you slice it, double booking can be divisive in your relationships. It may be awkward for us to double book, but it can be very painful to be on the receiving end, especially if you are the one who must endure the broken promise. Even when you know it was an honest scheduling mistake, it still hurts to know your friend or loved one passed the broken promise to you. An experience like this may make us wonder if God ever double books. The Bible is full of promises the Father makes to his children. Is it possible he's overpromised? We need to take back his promise to you in order to keep it with someone else? The answer, of course, is absolutely not. The promises of the triune God of love are aimed to bring peace in all our relationships, not to divide them. Psalm 133 gathers up rich imagery from Israel's history as a description of God's promises kept. 
How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Our Father has no problem keeping his promises, even when he double books. In fact, in Jesus, we find that he goes far beyond just double booking. He extends his promise of blessing to everyone in his Son, Jesus Christ. You can rest assured that the Father's promise to you will not be taken back by his promise to another. His glory is for all of our good. I'm Michelle Fleming, Speaking of Life. Thanks for watching this episode of Speaking of Life. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to connect with you. Here are a couple of ways. Subscribe to our newsletter, GCI Update, and like us on Facebook. And if you'd like more resources from GCI, check out our website. Thanks again for watching. See you next week.